Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, The Ink Reader. Today I am filming on my feet. This is very new for me, because usually I sit on my chair, but she is noisy, she is just... I just like the idea of being able to stand sometimes. So this is an experiment. Unfortunately, I wanted to film this video today because there was sunshine, and then London did what she does usually, which is giving me a morning of sunshine, and then deciding that we are gonna have pouring rain for the rest of the day so unfortunately by the time I got home it was just end of the world it's grey sky it's 3 p.m. and it looks like it's midnight outside so we are trying to make this work as much as possible so today without further ado I'm gonna go through my favorite reads of the year it was a kind of difficult video to make uh, I'm not gonna lie main reason is because first of all I had a lot of debate between number one and two and um, because I didn't know which one had to go first basically first place and also it was easy to find the first five but the other ones I struggle a bit more because there were a lot of books that I might have loved or liked for some reasons but maybe weren't perfect five stars so I debated a lot on do they deserve a place on this list or not and that's when it became complicated and then I decided to sit back and just make this list my list so not thinking about quality necessarily not thinking about what other people would like this list to be like this is my favorite books of the year and I decided to go with the books that gave me something other emotions other answers or like just kept me on the edge of my seat just books that stuck with me throughout the year and then I just kept thinking about them and then I would in a conversation I would maybe mention them and just say oh I've read that and it did that so even if it were imperfect even if some of them might not have been perfect five stars this is what stuck to be the most with 10 books that really seeped under my skin for one reason or the other so there are some books that I gave five stars that are not in this list because they were amazing, maybe quality was a seller, but they just didn't get a spot, a special spot in my heart, if it makes sense. So without ado, let's get from number 10 to number one. Okay, so at number 10, we have a non-fiction to crime, which is the only one in this list. So all the other books that you're about to see are fiction, but this is the only true crime that I have read and really stuck with me the most. I have read unfortunately not as many non-fiction as I used to in the past years so I've been missing them but quality wise even the few I've read probably would be better than this so this has no stellar writing whatsoever and definitely I think there is a lot of debate about these and the questions of the author of putting this book out so I'm not debating the fact that many of the true crime and non-fiction I've read apart from this one quality wise would be they would deserve more to be on this list. However, this book just provided me with so many answers to questions I had since I became obsessed with this case in my university years. And I just, when I compiled this list and I looked at all the books I read, every time my eyes popped on the cover of this book, just brought back the experience of listening to these and getting so much out of these. So this is number 10, how I helped OJ Simpson got getting away with murder, something of a sort, it's a bit of a mouthful of a title. And this is a book by an ex-manager of OJ Simpson telling us, telling the reader about how he helped OJ getting away with murder. Now I never had any doubts that OJ had killed Nicole and Ron. However, I, from the process, following the process, there are some, a few questions, a few things that didn't just make sense. And by reading these, I got all the answers. So now this book gave me all the closure that I wanted. And for someone who's been so obsessed as I have, this book is a gem. Now, of course, I can't testify on veracity, on the veracity of, of all his statements. However, it did feel pretty true, like sitting back, looking at all the cases and all the books I've read and documentaries I've watched and remakes on Netflix. I watched everything just comes together in these. And I think it just makes a lot of sense. Like finally, a lot of things make sense. So for, you know, I want to believe that this is the final truth. I want to believe that like with this, I'm convinced the case is closed for me. I've got all my answers. And so yeah, quality wise, I can say that's not probably the best non-fiction true crime 
by no means that you'll ever read but if you've been obsessed like me about the OJ Simpson case or even if you're curious the more important questions are answered in this so yeah it was a gem for me for those reasons at number nine we have uh, historical fiction and I didn't think initially to put this on my list but then when I was looking back at all the books I had read in the year this one kept popping up in my mind and I just loved the writing so much loved the atmosphere the author created so much that I just said yes it deserves a place on this list so at number nine I have the thousand autumns of Jacob de Zouet. this is a David Mitchell a book who wrote Cloud Atlas. I didn't like the movie, I watched it decades ago, I should rewatch it. So I never thought I would actually enjoy a book of his and then I found this book in a charity shop, read it and actually really 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 enjoyed it. So this is the story of this Dutchman, he's a clerk and he goes and work as an accountant in Dejima. So Dejima apologies if I'm butchering the name, it's a man-made island on the coast near Nagasaki in Japan where people from the western world could go and trade with Japan so you know they said you can stay here, you can trade with us but you can't enter Japan officially so this takes place, I think it's like kind of like you follow him and one generation after so it takes place in a, like a span of many decades and you just follow his adventures and how these two culture clash and intermingle on this island and it's just it was very powerful, although it's a very quiet historical fiction, so there is not much action, it's more like a character driven and more like an exploration of this unique, unique place in the world because it's not necessarily Japan but it's, of course it's not Netherlands or anything of the sort so it's like in between and you know these Dutchmen navigating these and navigating love and work and betrayals and so on so it's a very quiet non-fiction but for such a lengthy book it kept me glued on the pages and I was just so enthralled so fascinated by this world and his writing is stellar so yeah it's a quiet one don't go into these expecting like major action or anything of the sort Although in the end there was a bit of that and I loved it, but it really made me feel nostalgic for a life in a place that in reality I would not probably wish to have lived or seen, but somehow I felt like I was there throughout the book and it was a very weird sensation that stuck with me since January 2022. So that is remarkable and I will definitely pick up more by him. Number eight, I have a book that in the end, so the let, latter part I didn't love as much as the first one, but the first part was so good, so fascinating, so having me like wanting to read because I needed to find out what was what was going on that I just kept thinking about this and kept thinking about I need to I need to read more of this genre, I need to read more by the author, and it just I don't know, it's just something that gave me the kind of creepy, what's about to happen, kind of um, gross out at times, but at the same time fascinating. It's like kind of, you know, entering an abandoned house at night, that kind of feeling. It gave me like you're shooting yourself, but you still want to do it somehow, some people. Probably not me. I like the idea, but I don't like, I would never actually enter the house. I, I don't know how to explain it. Anyway, this book just gave me those feelings without putting me in any danger. And this is Into the Drowning Deep. So this I think is a pen name, Mira Grant, she wrote also like the Every Heart Doorway or something of the sort, if I'm not mistaken. She's a pen name for this author and this is basically the story of this crew that goes in the Mariana Trench to investigate what happened to a past crew sent by this TV broadcaster to do a documentary and they those people disappear now a bunch of years later they put on a new crew more prepared to go and investigate what happened to the old crew but as well as what did they find there what is in the Mariana Trench in the you know the deepest part of the ocean what is in there and they know there is something because they had some footage recovered from the past crew but they don't have a full picture of it so they go there to investigate and you follow a bunch of characters the, half, the first half, maybe like three quarters where you are just finding out about what's in there and what happened to the other crew and just exploring the depth of the ocean 
and I have, I think there is even a name for it, I'm trying to put it here, which is like a, a phobia of a deep ocean. This called to my deepest fears. And for that, glued me to her pages, and it was just like, what's about to happen, what's about to happen? And there was a lot of action toward the end, and it's very th mystery thriller, definitely a mystery thriller, that it's well done overall. Yes, I wish there was a sequel, because I think there are so many questions that we don't have an answer for. Yes, I would love a movie of this. And please, Mir Grant, write more horror, because horror thriller like this, because it's just my cup of tea, just it was perfect for me like i wish i could read a book like this every month that gives me those kind of i'm scared by one and all vibes and number seven we had a book that i had not expected to love this much mostly because i had heard a lot of people just saying that this was not a genre was not the genre that was advertised at so a lot of people got into this with expecting something and didn't get it so it was just like it's on my shelves let's read it but i don't know and i ended up absolutely loving it and this is and i darken this is a ya which is very weird for me is it ya kind of it's a pretty rough ya though it's pretty adult for a ya if you want the content is pretty brutal and this is basically a reimagination of vlad tapes the inspiration for Dracula and you follow his son and daughter being given away as hostages to the Ottomans and growing up in the you know in the an enemy kingdom and plotting revenge it's just a lot of conflict between them growing up and loving some of you know the enemies and at the same time wanting to go back and wanting to reconquer and wanting to avenge what has been done to their country. This is an historical fiction, first of all, it's not a fantasy. And when I kind of researched before getting to these and didn't expect any fantasy in these, then I had an amazing journey because I knew this was historical fiction again. And I absolutely love, love, love her. I think she is my kind of unlikable character and the relationships in here and the layers that these characters have and you know their kind of contrast and conflicts within themselves of the way they were raised and then sent in this enemy country hostile country and then all the wishes and all the love and betrayals is just something that hooked me from the start i immediately bought the next two books wishing and hoping that the quality stays throughout the trilogy and it's something that I've never read, especially in a YA. Her, I think a lot of people get confused because they imagine her as Vlad Tapes. So it's kind of, oh, having a Vlad Tapes, but she's a woman. In theory, not incorrect because she's the daughter of him. She's the daughter of Vlad Tapes. And also, I guess it plays a part in me loving this, is my fascination in general with Vlad Tapes. First of all, it's inspired, he's inspired Dracula, which is my favorite classic ever, which is like a love vampire fiction. So the fact that, you know, automatically, in a sense, when I researched the history behind Dracula, I could not, not be fascinated by Vlad Tapes. And also, like, as someone who's loved true crime and psychological, forensic psychology and all of that, like, I think Vlad Tapes is just a very interesting character. And so I loved the um, fictionalized version of his daughter being probably as bad, if not more, than him. So yeah, loved these. At number six, I have my favorite humoristic fantasy, a book that I had actually previously watched the movie and never got around to read the book. And then I wanted to try the book because I had it and I had in a special edition, which is up, up there, my bookshelves, and I'm just too short and I can't reach it. And so, yeah. Anyway, isn't that, I put a picture here. This is the Eye Tracker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is many of you. Probably all of you will know what it's about, but it's about this basically this guy who's very much down his luck. And then on top of everything, his best friend, mate, whether you want to call it, um, knocks at his door and just says, come to the pub with me, I've got something to tell you. The world is about to get destroyed. I'm an alien and actually I can save you if you come with me. And they go on this journey throughout the galaxy. And it's just crazy. Like I was just reading these and it's just like, how did this man come up with these ideas? Like, I loved it, I had a good laugh. Honestly, I don't have much to say about this apart from this was a good time from start to finish. I was always smiling, I was always in awe of what this author could come up with. And I definitely want to continue on with the series, although I've heard that the first book is probably the best. But do let me know, have you have read all the series? Is it that good? 
Should I keep going? I mean, I will keep going, but I'm curious to know what you thought about the whole series. At number five, I am gonna cheat. <laughs> in the sense that I have two books by the same author. They are not related. They are not part of a series. They are both standalones. However, they take place in the same town and there are some Easter eggs in one from the other. And I can't just choose between the two because of reasons I'm gonna get in a second. So I have The Summer That Melted Everything and Betty. Now I can't find my copy of Betty, it must be here somewhere because I tapped it after that book, so it's here. So now The Summer That Melted Everything, it's about this attorney and he one time during a heat wave in Ohio in this small town where he lives with his family, he dares the devil to come to their town for whatever reason you're gonna find out in here. And the next day, or well, a few days after, a black boy is found in the town abandoned and he says he's the devil. And you follow what happens to this attorney, his family and this boy. And this book shook me, like I can see I've tapped a bit <laughs> of this. This book just made me shiver from head to toe, from the start to the end. I think such a powerful story and her writing as something. And I think her writing is definitely maybe not for everyone, but she's probably one of the most refreshing and one of my favorite authors that I found, if not the favorite author I found this year. I had never read anything by her and now I've read two of her novels and I am absolutely in love with her. And so this is Summer of Method Everything. Betty, Betty is actually a mix of non-fiction and fictionalized biography of Tiffany McDaniel's mother. So her mother, she is the daughter of a Native American and a white woman. And she, because of this, experienced a lot of discrimination. And she had a big family, a lot of siblings, and you follow in Betty, the story of Betty, the mother of Tiffany McDaniel, and what happened to her family and her siblings. And this is one of the books that we read, I read with my book club. And it then led us to have a five hours non-stop conversation on this book, which is remarkable because it just provides you with so much content and so much food for thoughts. So much depth in this 500 pages book. It is torture, a bit like reading A Little Life, only that you know that a lot of the things in here, if not the majority of things in here, are actually really, they really happened. And this made this even more harrowing than um, A Little Life. So I would prefer Betty, I do prefer Betty, to A Little Life a million times over. Although I don't deny that A Little Life as its quality, but I think Betty just does something even more and also it's based on the truth. And so it makes you think so much more because of that. I don't know how to explain it. And it's just remarkable how she, Tiffany McDaniel, managed to write a biography about her mother without sugarcoating anything, with showing you all the horror that they experienced while at the same time I'm honoring her mother that much. It's just a remarkable book. It's a very tough read. It's, it, I don't know, I don't even know if I want to suggest this to people. If you feel like hurting yourself, if you feel like feeling pain and sorrow and crying and just being distraught for days, read this. But at the same time, I can promise you that if you read Betty, you, it will change you somehow as a reader. Like you can't read a book like this and just just go out about your day like nothing happened. It's a book that's gonna, it's a statement in itself. So that is why it's in here. It's so, such a powerful book. Um, I will reread it eventually and I quoted so much about this book. I am, she definitely is one of my favorite author ever after reading Betty and The Summer of Melted Everything. So yeah, Betty. Uh, I'm still feeling like oppressed in my chest when I just speak about Betty. At number four we have Assassin's Apprentice. Now, finally, I read my first Hob book this year, and yes, it's as good as you say. This is a massive series, fantasy series, and you have sub-series in it. So this is the first sub-series, I think it's a trilogy, and in this you follow Fitz, and Fitz, he is the bastard son of a prince that as a result of having this bastard son decides to remove himself being in line for the throne he just goes away and leaves the baby behind to be raised in the stables because of this of course he has to overcome a lot of adversities in his life and you just follow him 
growing up so here is from a kid to a young boy but i guess we're gonna follow him until he's becoming an adult and so on and what i loved about these is that these was a ve it's a very much set up for the whole series and yet her writing you've heard this a million times so i'm not going to spend too much time about this just absolutely remarkable um, the writing, the atmosphere he, she creates and how much I grew attached to the characters despite this not being that much, that long as a book, if you make sense. Sorry guys, I had to switch on the light which is horrible. I am gonna invest in lights but one thing at a time because I bought a few stuff from the camera, <laughs> not the lights, but I bought a few stuff from the camera this year already and you know, I need to pace myself because things for the camera are quite expensive. Uh, anyway, Number three, so we are getting into the juicy part. So number three, if you've followed me for the year, you probably are gonna expect all of these books to be on this list. And so there are not gonna be many surprises here, but whether. So at number three, my darling, my favorite author, fantasy author, Edda, and just this man, he wrote my favorite book ever, so my favorite series ever. So of course this book had to be in here. I thought I was very late to the party, very late in reading this. This has to be Fire and Blood. So finally I got around to reading Fire and Blood and enjoying just the format of this book first of all so much because it's full of drawings. Can we appreciate these? This is considered like a history book, fantasy story history book. So it's a fake history book. And it's the story of the Targaryen. It's the first part of the story of the Targaryen. So I believe there must be another book at some point, but we know with Martin how it works. This man likes to torture us. He likes to give us a book, make us fall in love, wanting us to read more, offering our kidneys to read more by him. And he just goes on a hiatus and doesn't write the sequel for decades. So he he is mean, he's a mean man. I recognize that George R. R. Martin is, is as skilled as a writer as a mean as an author he is uh, very mean and so I read this loved this especially because other people were like oh but this reads like a history text I wish my history texts I wish they were so good I'm kidding I actually love history and I think it does help with me being a big history nerd in general than appreciating something like this so much and I think it, it does play a part in that but with Targaryen Fire and blood are just, it's, I think I'm, it's my motto, like I want to let a tattoo that, like, you know, I will probably add it to my tattoo at some point, just I love the Targaryens, I love how twisted they are, I love what he makes of their history in here, I love the twists, I love the action, it was never boring, and I don't know how much you can read about people screwing their brothers and sisters and betraying each other and killing each other over and over again and never getting bored of this i don't know how but he makes me care so much all the time like all the time feels like oh, is happening is it oh that's a sister weather and every time i feel upset even if by now i should get so used to it and i just love this world i have to say though i don't love every martin book i've tried other series by him and they didn't work for me and so i really think he should stick with westeros and you know blood and fire then um song of ice and fire series and all these characters he found his gem just stick with it i can read a thousand books like this and i really hope that i can read the sequel of these before i am middle-aged and now we are getting to the difficult part because i kept putting and exchanging these two books. So I kept saying, oh, this goes number one, this goes number two, and vice versa. And then ultimately I decided to put them how I did because the number two book is a book in a genre that I knew I would love, only because of that, because honestly, enjoyment-wise, there would be one, both would be a first place. But because of that, I decided that, because this is a, my favorite genre, it just sat in a genre that I was already loving, even the idea of reading something like that. That was just a bit less of a novelty than the book that I got first place. However, second place, I've got The Empire of the Vampire. Again, yes, I am late. I know that this is not a new release or weather, but I read it this year and I loved it this year. And can you see how many quotes? Now, I 
love vampires. Like vampires are my favorite creatures in fantasy and I love high fantasy and I love grim dark fantasy. So if you have a high fantasy with vampires in it, like not Twilight vampires, like vampires, they're mean as fuck. They are dangerous, like you, you don't wish to live in a world where these vampires are real. Together with good writing and the grim dark subgenre, you end up having these. And honestly, as I wrote in my Goodreads review, it's like Mr. Christophe sat down with me one evening and told me, Eva, what kind of book would you like to read? And I told him and he got home and he wrote this. This is exactly how it felt like reading this book. I loved every single pages of his, I loved his writing, so many quotes. I'm just so here for the sequel. And I think this is just my, this is just everything that I want in a book. So if you ask me, what kind of book is your book? This is my kind of book. I loved this way more than I lo loved N Nevernight, and I did love Nevernight, but this I loved way more. It's like if, you know, these Game of Thrones, those are my kind of books. And he, they have to be harsh, they have to be brutal, bloody, they have to break your heart, and they have to have sassy writing. I don't know if it's a cliche, I don't care. This is the kind of book I love, and I will read a million of these books. So I'm waiting for the sequel, and it's also there are also like illustrations in it, and it's amazing. I know there are special editions where the illustrations are like colored, which I am, I am tempted, okay? I'll just give you one of the first, so it's not that much of a spoiler. So, yes, this is a book that I will reread, like Game of Thrones, that I will cherish, love. And I have to say that these last three places, so book number three, Blood and Fire, Fire and Blood, Fire and Blood, Fire and Blood, and this one, and, you know, the one that you're about to see, number one, have entered definitely the, the pantheon of my favorite books ever. So, that's, that's a lot. Three books three of your favorite books ever in one year, that's a lot. And number one, one of the first books I've read in January and the only book in my life where I was generally so upset that I think I didn't eat <laughs> because I needed to know what was happening. And if you ask me, how would you translate poor adrenaline you know, the adrenaline that shuts down part of your brain and makes you just feel a rush in your body, like your heart is beating faster, your breath is shallow, you're shaking and your and your stomach hurts because you can't digest food because your brain is just like, we don't need to digest, we need to run away right now and save our asses. That's what this book feels like from page 10, probably 20, to the end. This is an adrenaline rush. Like, I can't describe it any other way. And I guess because of my personal preferences so I follow a lot of true crime I follow a lot of you know I'm I've studied a lot of serial killers and forensic in general is is my field in general of where I work wise and personally I'm you know I do a lot of research this character in these the main the bad guy in these just fascinated me so much and I'm number one a book that made me, me just sit uncomfortably throughout just because I need to know what was going to happen is Intensity by Dean Kunz. This was my first Kunz book and I had heard so many things about this book and all of them were true. And you got basically this girl, China, she has accepted to go during a break from university or college. She has accepted her roommate, friend, invite to go to her family house and spend the break there. So they are traveling, they're in the car, they're traveling, they get to the house, meet the parents, have dinner, and then they go to bed ready to enjoy the holidays from the next day. And during the night, China, our main protagonist, she's woken up by a scream or something of a sort. And from there, things get batshit crazy. Like, this book is nuts. And it's from a premise, you know, that basically someone is attacking the family, someone is attacking her best friend, and she is, she witnessed the attack, and then she has to attempt and try to save her friend from a very, very bad, guy and this man this this bad guy in here I, I don't know it's something else it's something else like he home invasions and this kind of predator like are one of the most scary things you can can encounter in life in my opinion and i guess again this plays on a lot of fears that i have it's like you know uh, into the drowning deep where i've got the phobia of the deep 
dark ocean. And these kind of predator just plays a lot of my fears again, so that's why I was so engrossed by these and at the same time terrified by these. And let me say just this, so China, what she does throughout this book makes no sense. Like I'm not here to just say this is realistic in any sense, like whatsoever. None of these would ever happen the way it does. Like none would be so courageous and stupid at the same time to do what China does in this book. No one ever. Like that's, that's against any survival instinct that we have as humans. I don't care. I don't care. This book was nuts. And you have to try for yourself if you haven't, I, if you, especially if you like thriller, thriller crime, you can't not read this. Maybe you won't end up loving it as much as I have. And again, it's weird to love something like this. I am terrified by these, but also it was brilliant. The writing is brilliant. You expect like a book like this is just actiony, the writing is nothing special. The writing was stellar. I love Kut. I am gonna read everything by him now just because he wrote this. He wrote now what has become one of my favorite books ever. And I say this, for example, about The Devil of Nanking, another of my favorite books ever. It's a terrifying book. It's nothing you can, it's not a good time. It's the most horrifying time you can have. But the fact that a book gives you so much terror, so many emotions, makes you feel like you are in physical danger and you need to check your doors, it's powerful. And this was extremely powerful. So yeah, intensity wins. But again, all of these books I've loved and let me know if you read any of them. Let me know what you thought about them. Maybe you all hated them. I'd be so curious to have a chat with you in the comments about them. Let me know what is, what are your three favorite books of the year. Put them in order for to the first. I'd be really curious to chat with you in the comments. I'm gonna let you go because I rambled on enough. <laughs> and yeah, take care of yourself guys. I'll see you next time. Ciao.